though Nazi Germany had already lost more than 3,000 planes over Britain, as 1941 opened, the Luftwaffe was still maintaining a merciless bombing blitz. Ports, provincial cities and London in its turn were showered ferociously during the long winter nights. Three to 4,000 civilians were being killed or wounded each week. But the frequent sight of Winston Churchill among the ruins was always an inspiration to the Blitz victims. With England tottering under the German assaults, the entry of Italy into the war in June 1940 transformed the Middle East from a training ground into a theater of active operations against large Italian armies in Libya and Abyssinia. Eight enemy divisions were deployed between Badia and Sidi Barani. Then came the first good news from this theater. The Italians had been broken, and falling back in disorder towards Badia, they lost miles of prisoners. Before dawn on the 3rd of January, an Australian attack was launched, and within 24 hours, Badia was captured, together with 462 guns and 125 tanks, at a cost of only 450 killed and wounded. A tremendous tactical and moral victory, which the diggers promptly celebrated in the town before setting off on the 60-mile push west to Tobruk. On his way to London to confer with Winston Churchill, Prime Minister Robert Menzies was given a VIP welcome by the diggers on the Libyan front and hosted by General Blamey. Surely there's never been a stranger setting for a surf carnival than this one, staged on the beach at Gaza, in the heart of the Middle East war zone. More than 2,000 soldiers, members of surf clubs scattered around the coast from Queensland to Western Australia took part in this unique march past. But the blue Mediterranean could not provide a real surf. Nevertheless, a welcome break from the monotonous grind of army training. Yes, all you need in any part of the world is some sand, some salt water and a bunch of Aussies, and you've got a surf carnival. Back in Australia, the Advisory War Council, chaired by the acting Prime Minister Arthur Fadden, met to review defences on the home front. John Curtin was there as Labour leader, Billy Hughes as Minister for the Navy, Beasley and Spender. Service Chiefs Sir Ragnar Colvin, Sir Charles Burnett and Sir Robert Brooke Popham, then Chief to the British Forces in the Far East, who brought news of the AIF contingent operating in Malaya. A landslide victory for Labour in the New South Wales elections placed the 49-year-old Redfern boilermaker William McKell in the position of Premier after 25 years in the State Parliament. He was later to become the second Australian-born Governor-General. On the 13th of March, just nine months before Pearl Harbor, the first Japanese minister to Australia, Mr Tatsuo Kawaii, arrived in Sydney was welcomed by Lieutenant Colonel Hodgson, representing the Commonwealth Government. And in his initial speech that day, Honourable Diplomat said, I see no reason why peace should not prevail in the Pacific. And then, exactly one week later, into Sydney Harbour sailed a squadron of seven American warships. A goodwill visit by units of a fleet not yet at war. A significant gesture of American sentiment. And citizens did not hesitate to give the visitors a full-throated welcome. For the first time in the capital's history, a ticker tape parade. More than half a million Sydney siders joined in a tumultuous expression of appreciation of President Roosevelt's promise of support of the Empire through the Lend-Lease Act. A memorable march. August the 9th, 200 miles off the coast of Newfoundland, aboard a battleship, Winston Churchill met President Roosevelt. An extraordinary top-secret rendezvous, which was to be known later as the Atlantic Conference. A conference to formulate an American warning to be given to Japan ten days later against any further encroachment in the Southwest Pacific. A warning which was to go unheeded by a nation geared for war and imbued with a determined policy of military domination of surrounding countries. Then on May 10th, a Messerschmitt fighter had crashed in Scotland and Rudolf Hess, Hitler's party deputy and confidant, parachuted to earth and capture at the point of a farmer's pitchfork. Hess claimed he'd come to give the British people a chance to negotiate peace with Hitler before it was too late. 
but branded as a war criminal, he was sentenced to life imprisonment at the Nuremberg Trials. Back in Australia, Commonwealth police and detectives in all states from the first day of war had been combing the country for fifth columnists. And as hundreds were flushed out, the investigators seized an extraordinary range of Nazi and fascist medals, emblems and a variety of weapons. The owners were promptly placed behind barbed wire and the damning evidence of their political associations gathered in a novel museum, including this apparently harmless walking stick. <laughs> To meet the need for more cargo ships, a programme was prepared for the building of 60 merchant ships at Cockatoo Dockyard in Sydney. Prime Minister Menzies, with Dame Patty watching, tapped in a rivet to mark the laying of the keel of the first 9,000 tonner. The first step in a rush shipbuilding plan, which was to employ more than 15,000 men before the end of the year. Hundreds of skilled tradesmen were engaged in the production of anti-aircraft guns. A mere 1,500 tons pressure coaxed the barrels into shape. Lathes reduced the parts to the finest mathematical precision and the finished article just 10 months from blueprint to test firing. An unbelievable achievement. A unique small arms contest. The Australian designed Owen submachine gun pitted against an American Tommy gun and a British Sten and the Owen brought home the bacon, a result which gave Army Minister Percy Spender quite a kick. In Queensland, the sizzling question was how to land the bacon, fresh and edible among the troops overseas. And this is how they sidestepped refrigeration. First, they boned and smoked it for 18 hours. Next, two wrappings of stockingettes. Then, of all things, a dunking in boiling bitumen, providing an airproof seal. 24 hours to cool off, another dunking followed by a coat of varnish, and the bacon was ready to be shipped across the world for frontline breakfast menus. After Benghazi had fallen, General Wavell ordered a large force to Greece to meet a probable invasion by the German army then in Romania. The first convoy, including some of the 6th Divi, landed on March 7th, and there were gay scenes as the Aussies and New Zealanders mixed with Greeks. But this peaceful, happy atmosphere was short-lived. Within a month, the German invasion of Greece and Yugoslavia began, and it was soon obvious that Blamey's Anzac Corps, as he named it, was hopelessly outnumbered and without local support. They had to withdraw. Many times it seemed the rearguard action would fail, but the crisis passed largely due to the cool leadership of veteran commanders and the cratering of roads and destruction of bridges by engineers in the face of the oncoming enemy whose bombers had complete control of the air. The withdrawal was brilliantly executed in night movements. Of 62,000 troops sent to Greece, more than 48,000 were evacuated mostly to Egypt. Practically all the fighting units were saved, though much valuable equipment had to be abandoned at a time when the British armies were still gravely short of weapons and vehicles. Australian losses in the abortive Greek campaign were 814 killed or wounded and 2,065 taken prisoner. Britain's naval strength in the Mediterranean too had been seriously depleted by torpedo and bomb attacks. Admiral Sir Andrew Cunningham faced the unenviable task of preventing German seaborne landings without aerial assistance. On the afternoon of November 25th, his flagship Queen Elizabeth and the two battle cruisers Valiant and Barham were speeding at 17 knots on exercises. A periscope was sighted. Then four torpedoes ploughed into the Barham. In less than five minutes, the 32,000 tonner rolled over, mortally wounded. Then her magazines went up. A self-inflicted coup de grace snuffing out the lives of 850 of the old warrior's crew of 1200 on November 25th, 1941. The federal election of 1940 had given the Menzies administration only the narrowest of majorities. There were rifts within the government and Treasurer Arthur Fadden took over the leadership. But the party strife threw into relief Labour's restored solidarity under John Curtin and Fadden's term as Prime Minister was to last only 39 days. I appreciate the great honour to be Prime Minister of Australia. I have been elected to this task under most extraordinary circumstances and times. At this juncture, I can do no more than promise 
my wholehearted ability and conscientious contribution uh, to the winning of the war and towards the maximum war effort for Australia. On October the 7th, 1941, Labour succeeded in carrying a no-confidence motion against the 23rd Commonwealth Ministry on a budget debate, and John Curtin became the country's wartime leader. The parties were equally divided, and another election appeared inevitable, but Japan's entry into the war stopped any election talk. This government not only stands for Australia, but it stands for all that Australia stands for. And the basic obligation on us is to be with Britain and their allies, so that the war that has been forced upon us will be fought to a successful conclusion, and when peace comes, it cannot be disturbed by aggressors for centuries to come. Dr. Evatt, Minister for External Affairs and Attorney General. Let us remember what we are struggling for. Two things. Freedom from foreign domination. A life worth living for all. But this political change did not interfere with Australia's support for the Empire Air Training Scheme, by which we'd undertaken to provide 10,000 pilots, navigators and gunners each year for service with the RAF. Already it was operating in Victoria and Canada, and so it was decided to establish another cadet base in southern Rhodesia. These were the first 583 airmen who were to earn their wings in South Africa as graduates of the EATS, the greatest cooperative effort of its kind in history. Many of them were to give their lives in the terrible dogfights over Europe. After almost a year of incessant, nerve-wracking bombing raids, many cities and towns had been reduced almost to rubble. Many people had lost their lives with thousands homeless. Food and clothing were desperately needed. And so was born in America the Bundles for Britain campaign, a scheme which was to be followed up throughout the British Empire. It spread like wildfire throughout Australia, and in no time an army of volunteer workers was engaged in gathering, repairing and remaking all manner of clothing to fit all ages. There was no time for fancy packaging, as space on ships was at a premium. So wool presses were used to bale the thousands of garments. A spontaneous response by Australians to ease the desperate plight of blitz Britons on the other side of the world. And there was another important job too for those on the home front. Camouflage nets were proving their worth in all theatres of war, and the market was expanding. In New South Wales alone, at 46 centres, the weaving went on day and night. Tons of twine were used each week as schoolchildren worked with parents and grandparents. Diggers blinded in the 1914-18 war lent a hand, and policemen took their turn in producing the nets designed to deceive the marauding enemy aircraft. And the scrap metal business boomed. Scouts and cubs, boys and girls, formed a tireless unpaid army gathering an amazing array of utensils. Pots and pans, aluminium, in fact anything at all that could be melted down to feed the furnaces. Tons of scrap, discarded in peacetime as useless, but now invaluable in the manufacture of weapons of war. Another sign of the times. At Canley Vale, Mrs. Campbell Cowie established this unusual dog's home. All her guests belonged to servicemen. It was her contribution to the war effort. Loving care for pets whose masters were in uniform. The main plates on each kennel tell the story. Wherever there's a war, there are wounded, and wounded need splints and other appliances. This was a paper war with a twist and a rip. Paste, paper and patience were the ingredients used to produce these papier-mâché utensils moulded into many shapes and sizes to augment the hopelessly inadequate supplies of metal and wooden equipment. Extremely light yet extraordinarily strong, these articles helped to restore many a damaged limb. Made from waste paper that did not go to waste. Centennial Park was the scene of a mass parade of more than 5,000 members of women's war auxiliary movements, auxiliaries to every fighting and civilian service, whose commander-in-chief was Lady Wakehurst, wife of the governor. And it was an unusual experience for Lord Wakehurst to take the salute from a parade led by his wife. 
and watched by Alderman Norman Nock and Army Minister Percy Spender. The women of Sydney following the example of their sisters in England. The Battle of the Year on the home front was staged at Sydney Stadium on the 13th of January when a packed house saw Ron Richards swap punches with an American middleweight, Carmen Bach, sporting the striped trunks. Eight months earlier in the same arena, Richards had gained a close points decision over the visitor and fans had been waiting eagerly for the return contest. Between the fights, Richards had defended his Empire and Australian middleweight title against Fred Hanabry and had won the Australian heavyweight belt from Max Rayner. Bath, colourful and popular personality, was a worthy opponent for the dusky, husky local champ. Bath won the middleweight gold medal for America at the 1932 Los Angeles Olympic Games and had gone on to world rating in the professional ranks. wasn't big enough for these two brilliant counterpunches, and Richards at the peak of his career was hard pressed to withstand the Americans non-stop barrage. Left leads took heavy toll on both faces. It was not surprising that Richards announced his retirement after this encounter over 12 rounds, which referee Joe Wallace decided was a draw. Established by Act of Parliament to commemorate those who gave their lives in World War I, the Australian War Memorial in Canberra is the principal monument of its kind in the Commonwealth. Early in 1941, its scope was extended to include the Second World War, and to honour the occasion, the Governor-General Lord Gowrie laid a wreath of remembrance near the Hall of Memory, which is surrounded by galleries and strong rooms, exhibiting and preserving the priceless relics and records. To epitomise what the memorial stands for, a 2,000-year-old funeral oration of Pericles, honouring the dead of a past democracy, was chosen. They gave their lives. For that public gift, they received a praise that never ages. A tomb most glorious in which their fame survives to be remembered forever when occasion comes for word or deed. Heroic deeds such as those performed by the rats of Tobruk under the hail of bombs and bullets from the Nazi Stuka dive bombers, who with the arrival of German land forces had completely changed the picture in Cyrenaica. By April, the Allied position was desperate and Major General Morshead was ordered to withdraw his 9th Division into the perimeter of Tobruk. Within a few days, the Germans and Italians had closed in on the garrison of 31,000 British and Australians. By April the 11th, the siege was on and it was not until 242 days later in November that it was raised. An historic resistance out of which the diggers emerged as the rats. But they paid dearly for their efforts. During the siege and the withdrawal which preceded it, 3,009 died or were wounded and 941 were captured. home came Grafton-born Lieutenant General Ivan Mackay to be knighted for his Middle East leadership and to take command of the land forces in Australia, comprising one AIF armoured division with practically no tanks and seven militia divisions inadequately trained and equipped. Regards my own appointment as Commander-in-Chief in Australia, I'm very much flattered by such an appointment, but I look upon it as a tribute to the men of the division which I commanded and the successes which they obtained in Libya and Greece and I also regard it as a compliment to the militia forces that a militia officer should be given such a command. General Mackay's return coincided with the arrival of the first casualties from the Libyan campaign. From the hospital ship Orangi, a peacetime luxury liner donated by the Netherlands government, the young veterans of desert warfare were taken to hospital by car. Informed by the army, parents, wives, girlfriends, brothers and sisters waited anxiously for the first glimpse of their loved ones. In both Melbourne and Sydney, crowds of more than 100,000 lined the streets to pay homage to those who'd escaped with their lives in bitter clashes with the Italians and Germans. And at the procession's end, these pictures tell the story of the tearful, joyous reunions. The first of many to be enacted in the years to follow.
On November the 11th, 37th anniversary of the end of World War I, General Blamey was met by the Chief of Staff, General Sturdy, on his return from the Middle East to become commander of the Allied land forces in the Southwest Pacific. A significant indication of the approach of war to our shores, emphasized a week later by the landing at Fremantle of survivors of the German raider Cormoran. They solved the mystery of the disappearance of HMAS Sydney. 300 miles off the West Australian coast, the two ships had engaged simultaneously at point-blank range. Each was set on fire. Cormoran was quickly abandoned, exploded and sank, and from their lifeboats at nightfall, the Germans caught the last glimpse of the Sydney, blazing from stem to stern, and to disappear with all hands and without trace. Meanwhile, negotiations between Japan and America had reached a deadlock. General Tojo sent Ambassador Kurusu to Washington to demand an easing of economic pressures. Gentlemen, you all know how difficult my mission is. But I'll do all I can to make it a successful one for the sake of two countries, Japan and the United States. But Washington rejected the move, and on December the 1st, Tojo told the Imperial Conference in Tokyo that it was time to strike from the Kurilis around to Burma. He pointed out that Japan's claims could not be obtained by diplomatic means, and therefore there was no alternative but to go to war. The date was fixed a week ahead, and simultaneously as Pearl Harbor was bombed, landings were made in Malaya and Hong Kong. Next day, John Curtin presided at probably the most historic of 354 meetings of the Australian War Cabinet when the Governor-General, Lord Gowrie, formally signed the Declaration of War Against Japan. The immediate and inevitable sequel was a unanimous vote of endorsement of this grim decision reflected in a pronounced surge of patriotic fervour throughout the continent. The inevitable moment had come at last. All the stops were pulled out to move the army training into top gear, and as quickly as uniforms could be issued, recruits were subjected to the grim methods of the instructors. For many, it was to be only a matter of weeks before the skill achieved in practice on these dummies was to be applied against the advancing fanatical Japanese. Across the Tasman, New Zealanders were also preparing. In direct contrast to the methods so successfully adopted in Palestine in the First World War, recent experience in the desert had proved the value of mechanised cavalry. The day of the light horsemen had passed, but the New Zealanders decided that in the event of an invasion, soldiers of the saddle would still prove invaluable in defence of the Dominion's rugged coastline. As the year drew to a close, in addition to maintaining three AIF divisions and substantial air and naval forces in the European and Middle East theatres, Australia had posted the 8th Division in Malaya under Major General Gordon Bennett. Resolutely, these men went through their training, blissfully unaware that when the time came, their part was to be cut so short, either by death or capture. RAAF was there too, but what a pitifully weak contingent. The Japs needed no heavy blows to achieve complete initial air supremacy. We had only 161 obsolete planes in Malaya to meet 620 modern machines of the 25th Imperial Japanese Army. The Commonwealth Department of Home Security was established and immediately set up the organization National Emergency Services. A civilian army of volunteers came into existence just in case the Japs reached our shores. Over 250,000 joined up throughout Australia. And so it was not long before stringent blackout rules were enforced around the coastal areas. Regulations which were not to be relaxed until September 1944. Slip trenches were dug in backyards, school grounds and parks. Surface shelters of concrete were built. Buildings were reinforced and sandbagged. Windows were taped or boarded up. When Japan struck, Fire and aircraft spotting were added to the curriculum. The authorities realised that the city's greatest danger was from incendiaries, bombs that could be dealt with on the spot by properly trained personnel. All militia units were at stand-to. Troops wired the beaches to harass any surprise landings. This was no time for panic, only preparations for any eventuality. 
Australian-built anti-aircraft guns ring the cities, ready to bark at any hostile aircraft. And still the flow of volunteers for the armed services continued. 400,000 Australians were in uniform, 100,000 were toiling around the clock in munition and aircraft factories and shipyards. 2,217,000 were on the Commonwealth payroll. One and all determined to subdue the ever-growing threat of invasion to their homeland at the close of 1941. A year to remember.